Hello everyone and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I am your host Bismarck and today we will be talking about a very special plane, the strategic bomber Avro Vulcan. Futuristic and avant-garde, it occupies a very special place in aviation history and is one piece in the puzzle of the British V-Bomber force. Let's talk all about its history and then hop inside this one found here at the RAF Museum in London to find out all about this plane. The story of the Vulcan kicks off in the smoldering embers of World War II. In 1947, Roy Chadwick, Avro's technical director, proposed a Delta Wing bomber to meet a new Air Ministry specification B-35-46. These specifications call for a near doubling of the speed and operating altitude of the present strategic bomber force. Avro was mirrored in this by Hadley Page, who proposed the Victor and Vickers with the Valiant. But that's a story for another time. The short Sparren was also in the run, but more as a plan, well, D, I guess. In the mid-1940s, the Delta Wing was a novelty. While its basic characteristics had been understood, designing a strategic bomber, especially of this size, around such an arrangement was yet another affair. Many foresaw issues such as control and stability problems. After all, it departed from the very tried and proven wing and tail designs that had been developed over the past 40 odd years. Yet it held much promise from performance over to load carrying capacity and Avro was prepared to take the risk. Before building a full on prototype, small scale tests were conducted in wind tunnels. To test the design, the Avro 707 was built, incorporating elements from existing designs to save a lot of time and effort, such as, for example, the Meteor's cockpit. This was a single-seat uh, mid-wing Delta uh, swept at 51 degrees, powered by the Rolls-Royce Dervet 5 turbojet. While it was a proof of concept, it had various issues. Shown off in September 49, it received a lukewarm welcome. The flying triangle, as one observer called it, was off to a bad start, crashing a month after its first public appearance, actually killing the test pilot. The second prototype, the Avro 707B, appeared a year later, with some changes to the gear, the cockpit and the nose. Uh, while at high speeds it still suffered from turbulence, air starvation and structural weaknesses in the wings, it had more stable characteristics, uh, so much so that actually a surprising amount of pilots got to test fly it, which is unusual for a prototype. One major change was that the air to intake had to be changed from the dorsal position to a wing root one. This would overcome the air starvation issue and was tested with the third prototype, the Avro 707A. The letter actually reverse uh, to the airframe, not the version, hence the backtracking there. With high-speed tests in 1951, we might assume that the plane was tested to go supersonic. Uh, this was not the case. The final product was meant to go subsonic anyway. Uh, a second 707A was built, followed by a two-seater 707C in 53. As testing continued, Avro started construction of the Avro Type 698, the full-scale bomber version, roughly three times the size of the smaller 707s. It's at this point that the Vulcan also receives its name. Various options were discussed, including Apollo. This one was discarded on the ground that, and I quote, mythological names are not ideally suited to this unique British achievement, end quote. Three weeks later, it was called the Vulcan. I guess the mythology was suddenly no longer a problem once they realized the trinity of the V-Force. By now the Cold War was heating up, but the RAF was, well, yet to make a final choice on whether it really wanted to embrace a strategic bomber force. It had a choice between three designs, the Victor, the Valiant and what would be the Vulcan. It adopted all three of them, which is somewhat Italian of them, and thus we established the V-Force. In 52, it finally ordered the service version of the Vulcan, designating it the Vulcan B Mark I. The first version, VX770, was about to be completed anyway, so this was a pragmatic rather than a betting man's approach. 
After completion, the prototypes featured prominently in public displays. Not without minor accidents, but you know, that's to be expected anyway. And its outlandish design, well, it became a public sensation. By 55, the first Vulcan Mark 1 B1s rolled out of the production lines, and at this point, a new wing design was also tested, as G-forces at high altitude had an undesirable effect on the outer wings. The solution was to change the sweep angle along the leading edge, introducing a sort of curvy appearance, and the introduction of vortex generators above the wing to re-energize the boundary layer. By 1956, roughly 10 years after being put to paper, the Vulcan was accepted into the RAF. Number 230 Operational Conversion Unit and Number 83 Squadrons were the first to receive the Vulcan, joined by Number 101 and 617 Squadron. Again, just like with the prototypes, tragedy struck before success. On a return from a goodwill flight to Australia with Air Marshal Broadhurst as co-pilot, owing to poor visibility, the Vulcan touched down several hundred meters short of the runway. Only the pilot and the air marshal survived as they had ejection seats. And then VX770 was actually destroyed two years later when it broke up on a high speed low pass during a commemorative Battle of Britain display. While in production, several changes to the design followed. Its wingspan was increased, the ailerons and elevators, well, the elevons really, switched to full span elevons control, and the engines and electrical systems were upgraded. The plane was slotted to receive additional countermeasures against enemy defenses as well. As the Vulcan was considered out of reach or owing to its design, too maneuverable or too fast at high altitude, it had never really been given weapons itself to be used against enemy interceptors. Initially uh, to be used as a horizontal platform, it was now meant to receive the air-launched rocket-propelled nuclear-armed standoff missile known as Blue Steel. The Mark II then appeared on the scene with Blue Steel introduced in 63 as a deterrent and potential strike tool against the Soviet Union. But very quickly the situation began to change. The Vulcan, having been phased into the service, had perhaps taken too long. It was expensive and the theory that had borne the design was starting well, to fall to pieces. The onset of stronger ground-based air defensive, high-altitude strategic bombing became impractical. The Vulcan, finally able to embrace the role it was meant to hold, became ever more marginalized and proved the practical application and part of the budget. Soon enough, the Royal Navy actually became the primary British nuclear deterrent. By 1970, the Vulcan's existence was one of soul-seeking. The tragedy of its existence was that it was superfluous just as it had come into its own. It's like telling a kid on his 18th birthday that he'll never be able to afford a house. To stay relevant, the Vulcan had to adapt, improvise, overcome, and so it did. Although envisioned as a high-altitude strategic strike aircraft, it was now relegated to low-level tactical operations. 20 years of planning went essentially out of the window, but it meant that the Vulcan had a future, albeit not really a rosy one either. Soon it was shifted over to maritime reconnaissance and finally slotted to be disbanded in the 1980s. The story of the Vulcan could indeed have ended in obscurity. Yes, it had captivated a large audience and presented itself as an innovative design. And yes, it had been a valuable deterrent for a certain amount of time. But the Vulcan's actual use and its intended role had been diminished exponentially. The irony is that the advanced design of this aircraft, alongst other strategic bombers in the West, was the very reason why it lost some of its potency. Through every action there is an equal opposite reaction, and a threat like this one could not be ignored by the Soviet Union, which developed potent ground-to-air countermeasures. With the new countermeasures introduced, the strategic shift towards maritime defense, at least amongst the Brits, became more obvious, and the Vulcan became an expensive toy with little immediate use. As the more flexible and modern tornado was introduced, the days of this aircraft seemed numbered. To the rescue of the Vulcan's plight came Argentina, 
ensuring that in one final salute, the Vulcan would end its career in triumph. As they were being mothballed, the Falklands War kicked off in 82. This conflict, which considering the writing of some tabloids seemingly never ended, saw the first and last operational use of the Vulcan and is perhaps the very reason why the plane became enshrined into the chronicles of history as more than just well a side note really. Fitting out a force of five Vulcans re-equipped and refurbished, Britain flew multiple long-range attacks against Argentinian occupied airfields in the Falklands. Uh, for this the refueling probes uh, had to be fitted again and uh, well this was a whole other affair because they had to be found first. I can't really go into it here but suffice it to say that for example one of them actually came from a museum over in the US. The crews also had to be retrained in mid-air refueling, something this aircraft had not done for like 15 years. Used in a conventional bombing role as well as sea, the Vulcan performed admirably considering the vast difficulty involved in the missions. Yet it also serves mentioning that its effect could have been a lot less uh, had Argentina actually made better use of its AA units and been more diligent in its logistical support and airfield repairs. That's not taking anything away from this word though, because it was essentially the only aircraft in the RAF arsenal capable of launching such a strike. So enough talk, let's get hands on with this aircraft. Now before we go inside, a little heads up here. The Vulcan is of course crewed by a crew of five, at least in usual circumstances. Now this Vulcan here, uh, when they were obviously preparing their force for the Falklands War, these planes were essentially being mothballed, as I already alluded to. This means that to actually get the aircraft into the air that they eventually used, they had to take you know, a whole lot of instruments and devices and equipment out of their whole fleet of Vulcans just to make sure that five of them actually flew. So once we're inside, you'll see that some of the stations, especially for the NAV radar, the NAV plotter and the AEO, you'll see that a lot of stuff is missing. But that is because this aircraft essentially sacrificed itself so that the other Vulcans could fly. That being said, the cockpit is actually pristine. So let's get inside. Careful not to bang your head and up you go. Coming into the crew compartment, you are faced with three different options. You have the nav radar right here, you've got the nav plotter to his right, and then you have the AEO, the air electronics officer over there. In order to actually get to your crew station, you just gotta swivel your chair. If you're the nav radar or the AEO, um, the nav plotter would actually have a fixed seat, and then you would be faced with your instruments. Now, as you can see, they are missing. There's a story to that, I already alluded to that. Um, but the nav radar operator would be obviously operating the radio, which would be in front of him right here. He's also doing a lot of the bombing with the Vulcan. For this, he also has uh, a bombing computer that allows him to launch his ordnance in so many different ways. For the primary navigation of the aircraft, the nav plotter right next to him would be, uh, would be sometimes working actually with the radar operator as well, but generally he would also have the instruments that would allow him to get the Vulcan to the place that it's supposed to go. Once we move to the AEO, we'll also see a couple of other uh, instruments that would be uh, used during uh, the operation of the aircraft. The AEO's job would, for example, be uh, also operating the countermeasures of the aircraft, red shrimp and all that good stuff. Uh, additionally, he, for example, has this periscope right here. He can check whether the ordnance has dropped properly. And throughout the whole uh, table here, you have a couple of compartments where you can store some of uh, your uh, work devices. Below the desk, you also have three heaters for food. That takes about 90 minutes to prepare. You've got the oxygen tubes right here and, of course, Although we don't see it right now, we've had all sorts of instruments in the Vulcan that would be used during the operation of the actual aircraft. One of the things you obviously notice in the Vulcan is, well, it's dark. And uh, as you can see here, right here, there's only two windows in the crew compartment that you can actually get some light in. Um, this was done on design, for example, for the uh, nav radar. It was very um, important that he actually has good contrast on his screen. But also in the case of a nuclear flash, um, you, you don't want to expose your crew to that sort of light sensation. Um, so there, there's good reasons why 
why it was a little bit claustrophobic and uh, sort of dark in here. So just below the pilot and the co-pilot seat, you have this little space right here. In the Mark I, this was used for, well, visual bombing, really. The bombardier would be down here looking at what he's going to be targeting and releasing the ordnance. In the Mark II, of course, a lot of that switched over to a radar-assisted uh, bombing, so it wasn't really used, as, used anymore. Beyond that, it could be used as a sort of storage space. So if, for example, with the latch the hatch behind me, you could actually cover this window here, and then you'd have the, the ladders in here. You've had some kit that you might be want to store for the journey. And uh, for the Falklands operations, the Omega navigation kit was also uh, stored in here. Um, for the rest, really, it does, didn't really have that much use in the later models of the Vulcan, um, but it's a little bit of free room that the crew can actually use in case of a need. That really rounds us up on the back here. Let's uh, move up front to uh, the cockpit and uh, the co-pilot seat. So getting into the cockpit is uh, going to be a little bit difficult, but uh, mounting up on the ladder here, in case of an emergency during the Cold War, you had a four minute response time. The pilot, while getting into the seat, actually only had, has to hit a uh, switch to his left here, flick it, and all four Olympus engines will start at the same time. This obviously accelerated uh, departure significantly. He would then move up even further, sort of swiveling, twisting to his right, trying not to hit himself too much, but I guess that's not a priority at that point. And then he would set himself inside. And once he's actually seated, the amount of room you have right now, even though you, know, you consider the Vulcan to be a massive bird, uh, the room you have here and in the crew compartment is sort of a bit cramped, but you do have enough space to move in. And this is actually a cockpit, considering the fact that the actual space it occupies is rather uh, small, quite a comfortable uh, piece. Um, to the left, we would have the main controls for the radio. Up front, obviously, we have the controls, so the flight controls and the flight instruments. To in the middle pedestal here, we've got your throttle controls. Uh, we've got uh, the uh, instruments related to the operation of the engine. Then going over to the co-pilot seat where the camera is situated right now, we would have essentially the instrument panel that the pilot has just mirrored. To his right would be a lot of instruments having to do with fuel and then in the central pedestal right here, which we just deploy like so, we'd have more switches related to the operation of the engine and the fuel supply of the Vulcan. Now, let's go through this in a little bit more detail. So, the control stick of the Vulcan is actually quite an interesting one. Now, you are probably used to this movement right here in order to go left and right or bank the aircraft, essentially. And then what you'd expect, essentially, is sort of a hinged movement in if you're using your elevator, so something that goes, essentially, uh, backwards at an angle or forwards at an angle. Well, in the Vulcan, as with, for, for example, modern aircraft, like you know, civilian aircraft like the Cessna or even the uh, uh, big airliners, you actually have a pull and a push, like so, uh, which makes it very distinct to a lot of the aircraft of the time, uh, which uh, operated the stick very much in the same way as you would be used from World War One and World War Two. So yeah, that's quite a quite an interesting little control uh, input device right there. Going through the instruments right in front of the pilot, we'll start with the altitude and auto land indicator right here. We've got a Mach counter, optimistically going to Mach 1.3. Vulcan never really reached that speed first place. We've got the variometer here showing your climb or descent. We've got the MFS, the military flight system here. Uh, we've got your speed and knots. We've got the altimeter right there. We've got a beam compass and then we've got an artificial horizon and turn and uh, slip indicator right there. Uh, moving over to the right then, we'll see a lot of the instruments that are related to the actual operation of the Olympus engine. So we've got the RPM counters for each engine, we've got the oil pressure for each engine. Up top from your engine displays, you have the return indicator on your control inputs uh, right here. In the Vulcan, we have elevons and not the traditional setup of ailerons and elevators. So your control inputs would be uh, corresponding, of course, visually displayed right here with the rudder up top, uh, just as you would expect. Set centrally between the engine dials, you've got your undercarriage switch and you've got a return indicator whether your undercarriage is locked or unlocked. You've got your fuel contents from the fuel tanks, per one per engine, set here. And then, of course, we're moving over to the uh, throttle controls, one for each engine. That's number one, that's number two, number three, number four, which you could obviously operate in unison just like so. 
Uh, to the left, we have the parking brake operated by the pilot right here. And then to the right, we also have the air brake that you can see quite nicely. They're visually indicated with the yellow and black stripes. That's essentially then uh, rounding us up here. And then on the co-pilot side, uh, you'll see that a lot of this is actually sort of mirrored uh, from the pilot side in a slightly different setup. But there is a relative bearing indicator that uh, we have right here that the pilot does not have. Above the engine, you have two interesting switches. First of all, you have the Ram air turbine release. You'd pull that right there if you have a fail in the electrics, and that will give you an all auxiliary electrical supply. Uh, and then we have warning lights right here for the engine. So one, two, three, and four. Uh, those would light up in case the engine temperature becomes excessive. You can press those and you would uh, deploy essentially a um, a fire extinguisher that would uh, take care of the excessive heat and hopefully also the flames. For vision outside, you'd have, well, your three main windows up front. You'd have a side window on each side for one for the pilot, and you'd have, of course, one for the co-pilot. And then you have your direct vision window right here, which you can open and close. In the Vulcan, of course, you also have a couple of dimmers that you can use for uh, when you're flying above clouds in the sun or something like that. Um, you just fold them down. There would be another one here for the main window and the ones on the side. You can just slide them down just like so. Now, one of the dangers, of course, of operating a um, strategic bomber, a nuclear, cable, uh, nuclear strike aircraft, really, was the fact that a nuclear flash could happen at any time in time if the Cold War went hot. In that case, if there was a danger of this, the uh, crew could actually completely seal themselves in, like so, with this cloth here, and uh, completely seal themselves off visually from the outside so that no light would penetrate into the cockpit and blind the actual crew. Apparently, in those cases um, where there was a danger for Vulcan crews to be blinded by flashes, um, there was also the uh, standard procedure of having the pilot and the crew at uh, the co-pilot wear an eye patch. So if a nuclear flash would happen out of the blue, all of a sudden, and one eye would essentially fail to, to, to work, uh, you could just switch over the eye patch and you still have one eye to, to work with. One other thing that deserves mentioning at this point, perhaps, is that when in during the Falklands War, the Vulcans had to air refuel, they carried a sixth, uh, sixth crew member. He would be standing pretty much where the camera is right now, where you are right now, and he would be guiding the pilot who would be sitting here uh, visually into telling him where he has to go in order to get uh, the nozzle uh, correctly placed for to allow air refueling. Uh, this was really just a, a special stipulation for those sorts of missions as uh, usually, as I already alluded to before, air refueling was essentially scrapped in the Vulcan um, 15 years before the Falklands War kicked off. You want to ask yourself, how does the crew actually get out? Well, for the pilot and for the co-pilot, it's relatively easy. They have Martin Baker ejection seats, and as long as they go over 90 knots, they can use those without any problem. For the crew here in the back, uh, things are well done a little bit the way, you know, in a medieval way, um, just like you would essentially do it in World War II. They had to get up. Well, the NAV radar and the AEO would swivel their chairs, and then they would be able to get out that way. Whereas the now, if plotter essentially has to wait for one of them to get out of the seat and then he can follow uh, and then uh, the ejection is essentially done manually. When it comes to the Vulcan, it is difficult to make a final assessment really. For most of its life, the aircraft went from one identity crisis to the next, with costs that did not correspond to its actual practical value once introduced into the RAF. It might sound a little bit like a downer for a plane that is so fondly remembered to, by many today, but I don't think it's necessarily wrong. Without taking anything away from the actual aircraft itself, its design, its story, its coming of age, had it not been for the Falklands, uh, then the Falklands would well, probably not even be remembered half as much as they are today. For me, the Vulcan is a beautiful aircraft. It stood at the cusp of what was achievable, went beyond that. It emits a very sort of graceful aura, encapsulating a passion for aviation, discovery, technological progress. Yet it also became a victim of its own existence, a story steeped in both triumph and tragedy. When it comes down to it, it's, it's a very human plane. Thank you very much for joining us on today's episode. And I want to thank the Royal Air Force Museum for letting us get close with their Vulcan. If you want to actually sit inside this Vulcan that they have here at the museum, 
just follow the link in the description below that will give you all the information and please also consider supporting this video and this channel with a patreon subscription or by sharing this video and as always i hope you guys have a great day good hunting and see you in the sky These are meant for clicking. You can do so right now. Just click.